Beneath its surface, the sea holds many treasures. A world that is forever moving, forever changing. It is a constant source of life. Guided by the glistening of the sun and the ebb and flow of the tides, the tail flickers out of sight and into the depths of a realm so wild, so mysterious so beautiful and so so intricate the coastline of southern africa hosts some of the most diverse and abundant marine life on the planet a species that once thrived in these rich waters has been so heavily exploited that it now faces commercial extinction. This is the story of South Africa's white gold. This is the South African abalone. You get many different species and ours is quite unique. It's the only one with these wavy lines on the shell. Um, all the other ones from around the world, they don't have these particular wavy lines. The color of the shell is determined by what abalone eat. So in, in the Western Cape, the shell is generally white on the top. And in the Eastern Cape, they're eating mainly red seaweeds and they get this whiny red colored shell, um, which is quite beautiful. Um, and this is our special South African pelham. The favorite thing about abalone is they, they're such a unique animal, there's, there's nothing quite like it. They've studied the shell, it's made of layers of protein and calcite, which is so strong that they've used it to design super materials and computer chips uh, based on the molecular structure of, of abalone shells. So they, yeah, they're pretty bulletproof, they, once they're sitting on a rock with that strong muscle and that hard shell, um, that's why they sit out in the open, they, they're pretty much immune to any predator, except humans. There was a phase of overfishing, but then they brought in a total allowable catch and it was limited to 48 divers. And so it was a very stable fishery for, for many years. They had a quota or total allowable catch of 650 tons. 
and then it was only in the mid 90s that a perfect storm happened. The street price for abalone really escalated in, in the early 1990s. Uh, the South African rand depreciated against the dollar, demand rose in China with rising incomes, which is where abalone is considered a delicacy, and South Africa's borders opened up after apartheid and, and the country re entered the world economy. So this stimulated a gold rush for abalone and then combined with that was the fishing rights restitution. So coastal communities are saying, well, we deserve fishing rights and we don't think these quotas that have been given out are credible. So people just said, well, we're going to do protest fishing, we're going to fish for ourselves. But it was really driven by this large amount of money. And then very rapidly organized crime came into the picture. So initially people were just fishing for themselves and then soon gangs came in and Chinese syndicates providing the marketing channel to Asia. It's taken from South Africa to neighboring countries like Lesotho, Swaziland, Namibia, and then exported through Chinese syndicates into Hong Kong. And when the Chinese entertain important guests to honor the guests, they will buy abalone. And South African abalone is regarded as the best abalone in the world. Uh, so the abalone from China sells for about half the price of South African abalone. Abalone poaching happens at unsustainable levels. We all know that the resource has been reduced to a fraction of its former abundance. And the situation now is that any formal quotas are going to be so small compared to what people are taking on the regular. So if the abalone fishery is going to be resuscitated, it's going to need people to have long-term rights and, and access to a resource that's available to them in some kind of attractive quantity. Uh, the resource as it stands right now doesn't seem to be available in that sort of quantity. It's inevitable that the fishery will collapse unless the whole structure of the way the fisheries run is, is looked at. To better understand the underground world of abalone poaching, we spoke to journalist Kimon de Greef about his insights into the fishing community of Hangburg on the slopes of Hart Bay, Cape Town. Hamburg is a place that's been actively marginalized economically and socially since before apartheid. Uh, there's very few job opportunities, people are largely poor, the unemployment is very high. And despite the fact that there's been ongoing and quite genuine attempts to reform the state fishery sector to include more people of colour in quota allocations, it's been quite a flawed process and it hasn't happened nearly as quickly as many people would have hoped. So there's a lot of frustration um, and poaching is, a, is an extremely viable alternative way to, to earn a living from the sea. A typical diving operation now happens at night. Um, men will get dropped off by boat. The boat leaves because the boat's the most valuable thing that a, that a little poaching team has. And uh, they get left in the kelp in somewhere like Robben Island with a torch, with their bags. They go down, they fill their bags, and they have cell phones, which they keep wrapped in condoms for waterproofing and send a little missed call or a, a text message when they're ready. The boat comes and picks them up and once they get their divers and their product on board it's, it's, a, it's a question of getting back to shore quickly. They do get chased sometimes. Uh, for them to be caught and found guilty they need to be you know, apprehended with abalone in their hands so often they'll throw abalone overboard and then return to Hart Bay. Um, they have secret drop-off spots where they unload the abalone and then there's carriers from the, from the community, sometimes kids earning an extra buck. People run the abalone in to some, somebody who's going to store it. There's buyers in the community who buy from divers. They offer different prices. And those buyers then pass the product on to, to operators from larger syndicates who take the abalone to drying facilities and eventually export it. It's a whole long, branching and quite complex chain that happens from Hart Bay onwards. My research was really just focused on the community. Hundreds of people were actively involved in drawing an income and some of them were putting that income to good use, building houses, sending their kids to school, putting food on the table. Of course, abalone poaching has also had a range of negative consequences which are reported on quite often in the media. I'm cautious sometimes to, to just speak to those, to those consequences because it's, I find it's quite easy to, 
to condemn abalone poaching and, and its social ills, which it no doubt has, but without taking it a step further to understand where it is that it comes from and, and what would be needed to stop it. A potential solution to the poaching problem is, is abalone ranching. This is a relatively new term in South Africa and involves taking abalone that have been raised on a farm and releasing them back into the sea. The purpose of this is to replenish wild abalone populations and to secure a sustainable long-term harvest for those communities or companies that have invested in the resource. Government have given out rights on an experimental basis to companies such as Luandla Fishing, who have started restocking depleted reefs near Port Elizabeth. This area has suffered from rampant poaching for more than a decade. There were a fleet of poacher boats, these super ducks with 400 horsepower engines on the back, operating full time, and they were taking between 1,000 and 2,000 tons of abalone a year, which is worth between 500 million and a billion rands. In other words, this fishery was bigger than the squid fishery, and they were poaching unopposed on the sea. They weren't being arrested. They were going to Bird Island in the marine protected area. You would see 10 or 12 boats there a day. And the situation was completely out of control. In order to curb the poaching problem in the Port Elizabeth area and protect the restock reefs, Luandla Fishing partnered with a private security company consisting of ex-military personnel. We explore this wild and beautiful stretch of coast before speaking to the head of the anti-poaching unit Tom Swartz. When the tactical task force first arrived in Port Elizabeth in 2013, we noticed 12 major groups. Since then we've managed to chip away at those and we are currently left with four groups um, that are extremely active but very elusive. Our patrols are 24 hours a day, seven days a week and all up and down where we believe that they are working. Unfortunately, we can't be everywhere all the time. Every time that we come across poachers, we never know what to expect. We are vigilant and awake and alert every day. In the beginning, when we first started, most of the poaching was done at low tide. Brazenly, during the day, divers would kid up in front of the public, go in and do their thing, leave their bags for a later stage. The public now started to phone us during the day. So the diver's MO has changed to poach more in the evenings, regardless of tide. Now it's a case of they'll take whatever they can, and it'll be at night, and it'll be two, three o'clock in the morning. He get out the vehicle, kit up, on his way down with his cylinder on, and his night lights on his head. He'd pick up his bag, and he'd pick up his tool, and then enter the water, and proceed with this poaching. To completely stop abalone poaching in the Port Elizabeth area is impossible. It is impossible. Because where there is a gap, somebody's going to take it. What you can, however, do is curb it dramatically. I believe if the Metro, if DAF, if SAP and whoever else is interested in abalone poaching had to pool our resources, I think 80 to 90% of it could be stopped before it starts. With poaching reduced due to efforts from Tom Swartz and his team, reefs that once lay barren can now be safely restocked with abalone from the farm. Our next trip takes us to the Eastern Cape community of Hamburg, where another ranching company, Lidomix Investments, has started research into the potential for an abalone ranching partnership with the local community. 
it's been declared as a presidential operation Pakisa project. So the, the presidency's got a drive to build the ocean economy. And this has caught their imagination. And so we're hoping uh, through our engagement with the Hamburg community to work out some sort of a partnership between the community, which would then own the fishing rights, and the abalone farm, which would then supply the seed abalone and then do the processing and marketing. To find out how this partnership might benefit the Hamburg community, we spoke to researcher Nomande Nglangisa. There are various projects running in Hamburg at the moment. There's a cob farm and there's an oyster project. But unemployment is still quite high here. And so a ranching project that is successfully run and managed has huge potential to improve the livelihoods of more people in Hamburg. I've found that all the stakeholders, so community, industry, as well as governments, are keen to participate in a co-management strategy. And so that is where a lot of the potential lies. The community here sees potential for their development and for the improvement of their lives. And, and they want to be part of pioneering a way to make that happen. Si fami si apalon ubana ngaba si noko funda si fundi so si fundi sani kati zeba lekle yoku fundi sana si zaza zindi ndoba na aingeze tu esba si pila kelkaisha si funa zonge izindo eskoyo esko eskoyo ezisimungi leyo zibe kuna kuitaisha lisi zuguluana because we don't know ba lipela la upela ni 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 lizo. But eyo nandi ba legle yu ndo kubana masinga ngebi plengas, masinga chongi apa pambu itu. Mas chongi efa apo siyako, kukuti apo siyako yu. We as now tata zongi ndo ezko yu luande si zkrepe kubasu siti mapileti na bandwa koyo ngoku. Abandwa na bietu, abandwa na babandwa na bietu bao chapi. So kuyo yu ngindo sienza yu na ilu ndo sifuna ndo kubana yenze ke ndo yobana kufanyi shwe ya palona. Injongo zetu ndo bana kunga pili kwa kanyi kupenefite ti na mapenefite ni susu gula na susu gula na susu gula na susu gula na susu gula. To find out exactly how abalone is cultivated, we took a drive up the coast to visit the Wild Coast Abalone Farm. We're busy driving up the, the east coast of South Africa. We're on our way to Wild Coast uh, Abalone Farm and uh, we want to find out a little bit more about um, the abalone farming industry in South Africa and uh, also to learn a little bit more about um, abalone ranching. We're the only abalone farm in the Eastern Cape. Um, all the other abalone farms are based in the Western Cape traditionally because that's where the biggest supply of natural food is, the kelp. We don't have any of that in the Eastern Cape. So in our business model, we had to include producing the seaweed to grow the abalone, to feed the abalone as well. Uh, we currently produce about 50 ton of wet seaweed every month and we feed it all to the abalone. But we also utilize that you know, we take our abalone effluent water through the seaweed, which you know, that cleans that up, so it's got an environmental benefit to us as well. Curious about what goes into producing an abalone, we took a stroll through the facility with hatchery manager Malcolm Mayer. Abalone are broadcast spawners, meaning they release a mass of egg and sperm into the water once a year during spring when the conditions are just right. To ensure a regular supply of abalone, Milcom replicates spring conditions all year round. Once they have spawned, the fertilized eggs hatch into larvae which are then relocated to settlement tanks where they develop into miniature abalone. Here, they feed on microalgae that have been cultivated in the lab. 
abalone are then transferred into new tanks where they are fed a diet of seaweed for a further six years until fully grown. Most abalone produced on the farm are exported to the Far East. But Wild Coast Abalone have committed to supplying 1 million abalone for reseeding back into the wild every year. To get from the farm to the ranching areas, abalone are packed into polystyrene boxes with ice packs to keep them cool. They are then driven to Port Elizabeth and transferred to a boat that carries them to the reefs where they begin their lives as wild abalone. Although abalone ranching isn't going to solve South Africa's entire poaching crisis, it has huge potential for change and offers a glimmer of hope for the future of coastal communities and the wild abalone on which they depend.